Welcome back. We're missing friends here today. Okay. Uh, hey, remember today, at some point today, uh, page 271, 280, 278 is due. Um, once I'm done with notes today, I might give you some time if you need to finalize some stuff, pick some stuff, ask some questions. Uh, we'll get to that. I only have a few notes today. Um, there's two proofs that I, I want to walk through. There's a couple different ways to actually prove it, but um, we'll, we'll actually talk about um, with these. And then um, basically the rest of the time is just kind of uh, time for you if you need to finish up 271, 280, 278. Um, I think midterms are due today, so any late work I think is due probably Friday for any of your classes, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, all right. So uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about section four six here isosceles triangles. Uh, we're talking about isosceles and equilateral. Um, the one note that I want you to take from today is that these two types of triangles are actually related to each other. So you can actually consider an equilateral triangle isosceles by definition. We'll get to that today. Um, but it doesn't go vice versa. You can't consider isosceles to be equilateral. So don't, it goes one direction. Um, but this is our chapter today. I want to make sure that we cover this. Um, I think we only have one more section. I think it's 4-7, um, which covers the last few notes of uh, triangle theory, which we're going to continue you know, later. I mean, it's, triangles don't go away. I mean, we, to prove things about quadrilaterals and other things, we use triangles. That's kind of one of the things that... Um, that I want you to know. Uh, we'll probably, uh, we'll probably after chapter four here, we're gonna, we might bounce, we might not go directly to chapter five. Um, basically, I just want to make sure that we continue the idea with triangles. I don't want to, I don't want to go into quads if we're not ready for it. Um, especially because I, I definitely want to finish all the properties about triangles, and so I want to make sure that um, if if we need to stay out of chapter five for a little bit, we we might. So uh, that's kind of a heads up. Uh, probably next week sometime, maybe next Tuesday-ish, we'll probably have a quiz in here, a test, test I should say. So you'll probably get a practice guide later this week, maybe Thursday. And we'll go, we always take the two-day review, because we only got one more section left. So um, I, I'm not sure what day we'll actually start the review. I don't know if it'll be Friday, if it'll be next Monday. But we always do a two-day review, and then we'll take the test. So kind of keep that in your radar. Um, I know that I think near the end of the month, it's like two weeks from the day, I think we have maps testing in here. So um, you'll definitely need your Chromebooks charged for that. But again, I'll, I'll remind you as we get closer and closer. Okay, any other questions about what we're doing today? Perfect, well, let's jump right into it. Um, we'll stay, obviously I want to do a quick review of the theorems we talked about on Friday, 4, 6, 4, 9. In case you were gone, maybe you weren't here, maybe you just don't quite remember what we talked about. We did, we did four theorems. Yes, that is four. Four, six, four, seven, four, eight, and four, nine. Um, we did, we kind of talked about how they work. We really spent a lot of time on four, nine. That was kind of the main one. That was uh, the HL theorem. That's uh, right. All these were based on right triangles. Uh, today we're going to be focused on new ones, which are uh, theorem 410 to 411, which are an isosceles uh, triangle. And then those will eventually mold into the corollaries, which are based on equilateral. So equilateral are based on isosceles. So that, that's how we prove corollaries. Corollaries are a follow-up to a theorem. They're not necessarily anything crazy new, but we do have to learn. All right, so that's kind of our goal today. Now remember, we do have homework due. Um, it's homework page 271, 280, and 278. No particular order. I, I kind of want you to do these first. These are all the algebra problems. Solve for x, solve for y. But Okay, questions? Perfect. Let's jump right in. Let's talk about, I'm going to blitz through these first four slides. The, the theorems we talked about Friday, I'm just going to click so you can see them, uh, so you can see the names. If you want these, I'm going to make sure they're online. I don't think I posted um, the PowerPoints from Friday yet. I don't think I got to that. So I totally forgot to do that on, um, on Saturday. I was supposed to do that. I forgot. So um, that will be online um, today. I will definitely get that on. Actually, I might do that as you guys work. So, uh, let's jump right into 4-6. This is the one we had Friday, mind you. Uh, the legs of one right triangle are congruent to the legs of another right triangle when the triangles are equal. So, uh, the vocab words we talked about with right triangles, again, a right triangle has a right angle. The legs are the two walls that touch a 90 degree angle. That's, that's for a right triangle, anyway. Um, the hypotenuse is always the big wall. That's something we will eventually mold into in the later 
properties we're going to discuss. Uh, but if the if these two legs are equal on two different pictures, so here's the, the picture from the book. So the two legs match, the two legs of another triangle, then the triangles have to equal. And we talk about like the four-letter acronym or the three-letter acronym system. Well, if you look at just the the order that these are in, like that's a side marker, angle, and a side, that's actually the reason why these are equal, side angle side. That's what we talk about on Friday. Um, we call this one a leg-leg congruence, or leg-leg theorem, I've heard it referred to as LL theorem, SS theorem, depends, but it works only with the right triangles. Okay, hopefully everyone had that from Friday. Um, now I know I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, I'm going to look through the next slide, but if you need this, it will be online later today, and I have a video from Friday going online later today. I think it's already online, I just haven't attached it to the website yet, so, okay. Um, next theorem was 4, 7, basically the same kind of wording. Hypotenuse and angle of one right triangle are equal to the hypotenuse and angle of another right triangle. And this was a random angle, it's not a right angle. Um, so hypotenuse and angle, then the triangles are equal. So here's the, uh, here's kind of the picture that they showed you. So we have the hypotenuse, that's the big wall, and a random angle, hypotenuse is big angle, and another angle. Then the triangles have to be equal in the, the acronym system that we use. Um, if you actually look at what these markers are, it's angle, angle, side. So it had to be this one. That, that was actually the reason why it works. The side was not in between them. Uh, that was a theorem that we had. I think that was theorem four or five. Okay. Uh, we call this one the hypotenuse angle uh, congruence, or HA theorem. That was from Friday again. And it'll be on the website, so I'll post the exact PowerPoint up there so you can see the end of the video. All right, um, four eight. Same. Oops, um, if one leg and, a, and another angle of the right triangle are congruent to the leg and angle of another right triangle, then the triangles are equal. And then this is the one that we spent some time on Friday talking about that. The picture doesn't have to look identical to what I have here. This one, okay? Because it didn't tell you which leg to pick. There's actually two, and it didn't tell you which angle, which acute angle. To pick. I can pick that one or that one. So it was kind of like you can mix and match, but there was different reasons why this one worked. Now this is the picture out of the book, and if you look at the markers of uh, angle, side angle, that would actually be the reason why this picture worked. But again, if you pick, instead of this wall, you pick this one, it would be angle, angle, side. So it just depends on like the, the, uh, the groupings that you picked. But again, what we call this one is called the lag angle uh, congruence or lag angle theorem, LA theorem. And then the last one, which is the goofy one, this was 4-9 from Friday. Um, if you're given a hypotenuse and the leg of one right triangle is equal to the hypotenuse and leg of another right triangle, then the triangle is equal. Thank you. Sir. All right. Um, and again, the picture here, um, hypotenuse and the leg. It didn't matter which leg you picked. We, we spent a lot of time on Friday proving how this one worked. And the reason why we spent so much time is because this this particular picture um, doesn't use an acronym from the three-letter system. Um, if you actually look at the markers, it actually spells an inappropriate acronym. Um, and so we don't have an acronym that actually proves this one. So what we have to refer to is one of the properties we're actually going to get today, which is an isosceles property. Um, and and if you watch a video from Friday, basically what we did is we took these two triangles and attached them. So I like turn this one, turn this one, and I attach them side by side. And basically what it formed is a big isosceles triangle. And the thing about isosceles is that certain angles are the same. And that actually is the reason why this one works. But again, it's weird. We actually used the isosceles triangle theorem to actually prove this one, um, which is a property we haven't had yet. And that's why I thought it was a perfect time like what we're going into and why I want to show you this one on Friday. Okay, and it's called the HL theorem or hypothesis like congruence, whatever you want to call it. Okay, any questions from Fridays? All right, I know I blitzed through those, sorry. I mean, we had them Friday, you can watch the video and see the PowerPoint online when I post it today. So, uh, but uh, let's talk about the new stuff today. Let's talk about vocab terms, right? So I want to take uh, just a few notes on isosceles, right? Isosceles triangles. Now, if you don't remember what isosceles means from Gee's book set back in chapter two, we talked about like the types of polygons. Is it way back in chapter two? 
but isosceles means two walls are the same. Um, so vocab terms are going to apply to this picture I'll show you here in a second. And then um, there's a couple of vocab words, which I don't even know if they have them labeled on the picture. There's a few on the picture, but here's the picture that the book always uses. Um, so as you can tell, we have uh, we have a couple legs. Um, these on an isosceles triangle, the legs here are the ones that match. Now I don't care how they draw it. I don't care, you know, if they have the picture turned. The the legs are the two sides that are equal, right? Then we have obviously the uh, the vertex, which is um, on this particular picture is the angle that touches the two legs. So that would be this angle here. This would be the vertex angle. Okay, and that's very specific. Right? On any other triangle, a vertex is just a random corner. But on isosceles, it's the one that touches the two legs. Then, um, obviously, the other words we talked about, like on this picture, is base. Um, you can actually see it labeled here. The base is always that random third wall. It didn't have to match the other two. It, it could be bigger, like this one, or it could be smaller. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then the base angles are the two angles that match. And, uh, and you can actually see that on that picture, that we have base angles, two and three. I actually show that they're equal. Um, there's an actual definition to base angles. It's the angles across from the legs. So typically on an isosceles triangle, they have those like little markers. That's what we talked about. What I always visualize is that these are like little arrows. They point at the angles that are the same. They go across. That's how I kind of like figure out what the angles are the same. All right. Questions with any of the vocab words that we're going to be using for these next couple, these next couple theorems and corollaries? All right, perfect. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Again, these are the words. So if you start hearing them use vertex or legs a lot, this one. All right. So let's jump right into it. First one. If two sides of a triangle are congruent. So basically, if you have an isosceles triangle, like two walls are the same, then the angles opposite those sides are congruent. So let you copy that out again. This is theorem 410. It does have a name. We'll get to the name here in a minute. So we're going to prove it. Now, there's a couple different ways we can prove it. The book does one way. I've seen it done another. Two sides of a triangle are congruent, and then the angles opposite those sides are congruent. Alright, so here's the picture that the book uses. I have a, an isosceles triangle, they have it being upside down at this time. The goal in this problem, this proof, this theorem, is to prove that angle one and two are the exact same angle. That there is no other way that we could get them other than being the same. And I'm going to kind of walk you through the process for how the book does it. I'll show you how uh, I've seen it in another textbook, because I obviously have taught out like four or five different textbooks. So I can show you two different ways to do it, which is kind of, um, kind of interesting to see the different approaches from different authors. Okay. Um, so. So here is here's one way we can prove that angle one and two are the same. This is like one way, and it's using constructions. So one of the constructions we've learned up to this point, if you don't remember, was that we can draw perpendiculars to lines, right? That what, what you do is you take your compass, you open up past the halfway, so let's imagine that this is our line. You open up past the halfway point, you make your x above and below, you turn your compass around, you go above and below, and then you draw this line that goes through the two x's. Does everyone remember that construction we did? Again, pass that way, x above, below, above, below. And what that does is it goes to, the, uh, goes to the middle, makes a 90 degree angle here, so all these angles are 90s, right? But the one thing we talked about was that it actually broke this stick into perfect halves. Actually broke into perfect halves. And, and then the idea here is that 
one of the things that that you can um, find out is that you have a midpoint here. I mean, that, 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 that's what it does. It breaks this segment into two perfect parts. What this is actually called, this, this concert we did, it's actually called a, um, a perpendicular bisector. So it's perpendicular to AB, and it bisects it. It cuts it in half. Now, if you notice my red line, did it hit point C? Did it hit, like, the vertex down at the bottom? Did it hit right here? No. And so that was just one of the goofy things about you know the way this author chose to do this is that if you chose to do this construction, you could find the midpoint, but it doesn't necessarily look like it hits point C, just the way that they have it drawn. Um, but what the author does is he goes, okay, we did the construction and we found that perfect middle spot, you know, that midpoint. And that was the whole point of the construction. I just want to know where the middle of that wall is. And now what I can do is I can take a straight edge and draw this wall right here. It's just, you know, I did a slanted line, I drew a wall from whatever this midpoint is out to letter C. Right? So that wall's cut in half, I have this line going here. Now, do you notice that we have two different triangles? I have this triangle here and this triangle. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, so far in both triangles I have two markers. I have this wall, which is the legs, and then I have this, the base, I basically cut the base in half. I have this side over here and this side. But, what do they also share? Say it again? Not just M. They, they, they do share, don't get me wrong. But what else do they share other than just point M? I've heard it? Not A, B, C. C. They share the stick in the middle. They share this wall. It's actually the reflexive wall between, between two triangles. It's actually the same exact length for this triangle as it is for this triangle. So if you actually look at the markers, what do these markers stand for? Or are they sides or angles? Side, 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 side. side. We, had a, we had a postulate that said when you have SSS markers in two different triangles, the triangles are exactly equal to each other. In fact, it was a postulate. It was postulate 4-2 that we had. So um, by SSS, those two triangles would be the same. And if the two triangles were the same, what can you tell me about angles 1 and 2? They would have to be. C, B, C, C, C. Right, the corresponding parts. That is the way that the author did it. So he, he did a you know a perpendicular bisector found point M, then drew the line making that reflexive wall, and now the two triangles are exactly the same. And of course, is one. Two. Now I've seen it done a different way. I've seen it done where with another textbook I think it was the actual geometry book they used last year, where the author in that particular book did an angle bisector. So if you don't remember how an angle bisector works, um, you take your compass, you draw an arc, then what you do is you basically just pick up the compass, you put it on the corners of the arc here, and you draw an X out in the middle. By just putting the compass right here in these points where this arc actually hit, and it draws a perfect angle bisector. Now if you don't remember what an angle bisector is, it cuts this angle into two parts. And it goes right through letter C. Now, do you agree that it hit the wall over here? Somewhere. I don't know where that point is. Let's call it point P. But it did hit the wall. I had to. right? We were inside the triangle, so I had to hit the opposite wall at some point. Now, this wall, oh, here are those weird accent history. This wall is a reflexive wall. It's a reflexive wall between two triangles because it's the same length. We have two angles that are matching and then these two walls. So this is side, angle, side. Side, angle side, and by SAS, um, that, was a, that was a theorem, I think it was SAS 4-4, the two triangles are the same. So it would, um, since this triangle is equal to that one, then yes, one and two would have to be equal to each other. So that was the way that a previous textbook did it. Well then I saw a different textbook, this one that I taught out of at Ventura, was that the author of that particular textbook said, well, at some point we've done this construction, you can draw a perpendicular line right to this wall. You can draw a perfect perpendicular line. Okay. And this is this this is the I think this is the one of the goofiest um, proofs of it. Um, just I'll explain once we get going. Um, so he draws a perpendicular because we have that construction that said you can draw a perpendicular to any point, and this is the point that I want. 
right? That you can go a straight line down to a line from an exterior point. So I did this construction. I can show you how to do that one again. But we draw this perpendicular. This is actually uh, the reflexive wall between the two triangles. And it's actually considered a, uh, it's considered a leg of a right triangle. That's a right triangle. This is actually considered the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Same with over here. And by, by theorem 4, 9, we had a hypotenuse leg theorem. That was the inappropriate acronym, if you don't remember. Um, HL theorem. That was theorem 4, 9. The two triangles would have to be equal. HL. They have a hypotenuse and a leg that match. So they would have to be the exact same right triangle, and that would force into 1 and 2 to be the same. Now, the reason why I find this so goofy, this construction, is because if you go back to 4, 9, we have to use this theorem as the proof of it. So they proved each other, which is really weird. And I think that was the goofiest way that I've ever seen it done before. That was out of the venture effect many, many, many years ago. In fact, I think they had the back shelf back there, the blue book. All right, but again, it works. Trust me, the two angles have to match. Now, what we call this one, it, is, it actually has a name. It is called the isosceles triangle theorem. It is the main theorem about isosceles triangles. That if two walls match, the two angles have to match the base angles. Let's move on to 411. 411 is basically this theorem, but we do the converse of it. So, so here's 411. So now, we're given the angles in the corners are the same. We need to prove that the sides opposite of them are the same. So, given the angles in the corners, we need to prove that this triangle is in fact isosceles by definition, that the walls are equal. So here's kind of the picture. I'm given that angle 1 and 2 on this particular picture are equal. I want to prove that certain walls across from them are the same. So what's the walls that are across from 1 and 2? Somebody give me the letter. What are the walls across from 1 and 2? That way and that way. D, E, and? What's the other wall? F, E. Those. That's what we're trying to prove. Those two walls have to match. They're the walls that are across. They're the two legs of your isosceles triangle. You have the base angles. I'm trying to prove that the legs are the same. Because again, there's this weird correspondence between angles and sides. All right. How this one's done, um, very, very simply put, um, it's actually using a construction I just talked about a little bit ago, is that I could actually draw a perpendicular line on a line from an exterior point. That I can draw this line that is perfectly perpendicular. Um, if I have a line and I have an exterior point on it. Now if you don't remember that construction, how we did it, how we draw this perpendicular, uh, you draw a smiley face then you um, with your compass, then you just pick up your compass and you put it on the corners of the smile here and here, and you draw the X down below by putting the compass here, then you switch around, you do it here, and you draw the line straight down. So it would actually draw a perfect perpendicular. Right? And that's what we're doing here. I draw a smiley face, put the compass over here, draw my X, draw the line straight through. So why that's important uh, with that construction? It makes right triangles. This is the reflexive wall between the two triangles. They have an angle, angle, and side. Angle, angle, side. And that was one of our theorems we had. That was theorem 4.5, angle, angle, side. So it actually proves that the two triangles are equal. Well, if the two triangles are equal, then what? Yeah, these walls have to be equal. Because they're corresponding parts. In fact, you would actually force this angle up here to be the same, because those are corresponding parts. And I could force this wall down here to be the same, because that's a corresponding part. And that's one of the, that's, this, this, this theorem here is actually the, uh, the big one that we usually focus on to actually show that when you actually bisect the vertex of a, uh, an isosceles triangle, it actually hits the opposite wall at the perfect middle and at 90 degrees. 
But again, that's bicycling vertex. Straight down to the base. Because that is an isosceles triangle. The two balls match. Now, again, the name of this uh, the name of this theorem it is the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem. They go hand in hand. They're perfect. It's just the opposite wording. That's what converse is. You switch the wording around for the if and then statement. But these two go perfectly hand in hand to show isosceles triangles are very special. That, you know, the midpoint of the base is actually perpendicular to the vertex. It's like straight and down. We got two corollaries today. Two corollaries. Well, um, I'm not going to actually prove them like I've done here. Like this, I, I know I've spent a lot of time like proving these. I basically want to show you the two corollaries and just basically just in words explain why. These are very very straightforward. They actually use these to prove them. That's why they're called corollaries. They're just a follow. -up. Let's move on to our last two properties today. So, corollary 4.3. Um, I find this weird. Typically, corollaries are actually numbered off of the theorem that they just particularly followed. So, like, I I personally would have numbered this corollary 4.10 part one, and then the next corollary we do would be corollary 4.10 part two, right? And there's two of them. The book, your textbook, actually gives numbers to the corollaries, like corollary 4.1. Corollary 4 2, corollary 4 3. I find that really weird. But whatever. Alright. If a triangle is equilateral, or a triangle is equilateral if and only if it is equal angular as well. They go hand in hand. So if it's equal angular, then it's equilateral. And if it's equilateral, then it's equal angular for a triangle. This only works for a triangle. So again, here's your picture. If the walls match, the angles match. And if the angles match, the walls match. Well, the reason why this one works is because of the last two theorems we just did. That imagine that I, I ignore you know, these markers here. So ignore this marker up here in the corner and this marker down here. And so you're looking at this triangle. So what type of triangle is that? It's isosceles, right? Two walls match. Well, then we had that theorem 410 that just said that the base angles have to match. Okay, that's fine. The base angles have to match because the walls match. Well, if I go this direction, same exact markers. I have two walls, so the two angles have to match. Because that's isosceles. So you can keep spinning around this triangle and keep using theorem 410 over and over and over, proving that all the angles are the same. And in fact, they're all related. Because, you know, in the first one that I held, I said a, a, angle A and C are the same. Well, then when I held my hand this way, B and C were the same for the angles, because the two walls match. Well, if, you know, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. So they're all, all three the same. And all the walls are half match because of the same reasons. So that was the first corollary, right? It's basically just using the property about isosceles, showing that it also works for equilateral that the walls have to match. Now, if all the angles are the same, what can you tell me that they are? Yeah, so on theorem, our corollary 4-4, four, four, all the angles have to be um, the same. They're equal, you know, they're equal angular, they're equilateral. All the angles are 60s in the corners. Because what do triangles have to add up to be? 180. So if they're all three the same angle, all three of these are the same angle like x's, I can add the three x's together to make 180. That was one of our definitions of triangles, one of our first properties we talked about. So that's three x equals 180. Then you divide by three. And all the x's would be 60s. Doing simple algebra. That only works for you know the angles. But again, the name of these two corollaries are just called the equilateral triangle corollaries. That's what we call them. They go hand in hand. They go together. I've actually seen another one that we've already done. 